Hello, students. This is a video talking about the major animal phyla of the world. Um, so we're talking about what are the main groups of animals. <clears throat> First of all, let's start out. What is a phylum or a phyla? Phyla is plural. Phylum is singular. It's one of those weird Latin um, combinations. Well, all living things are arranged according to their visible characteristics and their genetic characteristics. All of the living things that we call animals are found in the kingdom Animalia. And some things that you wouldn't think of as animals, but they are animals. Um, and kingdom Animalia, they're separated into their phyla according to some characteristics. But they all share some characteristics as well. Some characteristics that all animals share. All are multicellular. All are eukaryotic. Multicellular meaning made of more than one cell eukaryotic, meaning their cells have a true nucleus, and they're all heterotrophs, which means they must feed on other living things. None of them produce their own energy from sunlight. So those are some things that all animals share. So we'll start with the first phylum, the phylum porifera. It's also called the sponges. <laughs> porifera, pores are holes. So porifera literally means the ones with holes. Um, so this group uh, includes organisms known as sponges. Most sponges live in marine environments. Marine meaning ocean. Uh, there are, however, a few freshwater species. Sponges are sessile. That means they don't move. They don't have muscular systems. They don't move. Um, and most sponges are asymmetrical. They are the only group of animals where um, asymm asymmetry is the norm. Uh, their skeleton, they have a skeleton made up of spicules, which are tiny fragments of calcium, like our bones, or silica, which is what's in sand. Here are a few pictures of porphyrins, some sponges. Um, this is a drawing of some of the different spicules that make them up, some of the, the bony structures. You have a giant barrel sponge right here. You have some bathroom sponges, and bathroom sponges historically were the skeletons of real sponges. I was going to put this video actually on YouTube, not a public one. Are you okay with that? Okay. Um, instead of private for just the students. That was Mrs. Lewis. Um, oh, the barrel sponge is the one on the top right. Continuing, there are, however, a few freshwater sponges even in the Great Lakes region. So here are what the uh, Great Lakes sponges look like. They're kind of like little gobs of spit. They're really not that interesting. Um, but we do have a species of freshwater sponge in Lake Michigan. Uh, they make uh, these gemules. They're spore-like structures that when there is times of stress, the sponge can go dormant. Uh, but those spicule, or sorry, but those gemules are able to um, regrow an entire sponge when conditions improve. Our next phylum are the cnidarians. Cnidarians um, are sometimes called cup animals, which I think is a terrible name. Um, but that's because like jellyfish are cup shaped. Um, so the cnidarians includes coral, jellyfish, and hydras. Most people don't think of coral as an animal, but it is. Take a jellyfish, turn them upside down, and you give them a bony shell. Most cnidarians are armed with nematocysts. These are stinging cells. That's how they inject their venom into their prey. So think about jellyfish stinging you. Uh, those nematocysts are on the tentacly army things. Um, most cnidarians have them. Not all cnidarians um, are able to penetrate human skin. So some species either they don't have a toxin that affects mammals or they can't even penetrate our skin to inject their toxin. So those are the low risk ones. High risk ones are like Portuguese man of war. Um, which uh, can kill you. Um, interesting thing about some of these simpler animals, such as the cnidarians, their digestive system only has one opening. That means that the hole that the food goes in is the same hole the food comes out after it's digested. Tasty. Here are a few pictures of cnidarians. Um, so um, first of all, we have the hydra, which are named after... Um, uh, monster from Greek mythology. So there it is on a, um, what do you call it, a vase painting. 
Um, we have a couple different species of hydra uh, that you can find in freshwater here in Michigan. And in the ocean, there are some colonial hydras. So they're hydras that, um, uh, there's individual hydras that are all stuck together. So they actually function as one individual, even though some of the pieces can break off and start their own colony later. Another cnidarian that we have in Michigan is the freshwater jellyfish. Scientific name is great. My zoology professor, uh, uh, Professor Gator, Ray Gates, uh, used to go on and rant about these things. Craspidacusca sourby. Um, they're often found in calm freshwater lakes. Um, there is some argument about whether they're an invasive species. When I was in college, my professor never said they were an invasive species. Um, but now what I'm reading seems to indicate that they might not really belong here. They might be from Asia or South America. We don't really know. Um, so they do show up in Great Lakes waterways. Um, they tend to go through boom or bust cycles. So there'll be a lot of them one year and then you'll never see them again in that pond. And then all of a sudden a decade later, they'll appear again. Um, so um, they kind of, their population comes up and then disappears for a long time. Then they appear again and disappear. So they probably have some way to stay dormant for long periods of time. Um, these little guys, they look like gobs of spit floating in the water. They're about the size of a quarter. They're not very big. Our next group are the acelamates. Uh, so you guys might see some root words you recognize. A, M, un, and non means not. So then you got to ask, what's a coelom? Uh, a coelom is a cavity um, that exists between your digestive system tube and the outside of you. So if you imagine if you were to cut Mr. Dean open, um, after you get through the outside part and before you cut open his guts, there's kind of like an opening. It's not like it's air filled, it's filled with fluid and, and there's nothing really there, but there is a, a separation between the guts layer and the, the muscle layer, and that's the coelom. And these guys, the acelomates, do not have any kind of coelom. There's two groups here, uh, two different phyla, the platyhelminthes and the, the nemirtians. Um, so these two groups are called the flatworms and the ribbonworms. Uh, the root word platy means flat. So platypus, I think, literally means like flat nose. Um, in this group of uh, living things, there are some that are free living, meaning they swim around, they might be predatory or eating algae. Some are carnivores, so they hunt for their food. And some are parasitic. So the parasitic ones, they're going to latch onto uh, a living, a larger living thing and feed off of them, hypothetically without killing them. Again, these guys also, their digestive system only has one opening. So you cannot define mouth versus anus because it's all the same. So here's an acelomate that we do have in Michigan. This is called a planarian. Um, planarians live um, in water. I think they like still water, um, clean water. Um, so... Um, an interesting thing about planarians is they have the ability to regenerate. It's kind of creepy, but if you take a planarian and you cut a planarian in half, both halves make a new planarian. If you cut a planarian partway in half, you get some real creepy stuff. So there are some pictures online where people took planarians, which they're actually very small creatures, took planarians and they basically sliced right down the middle of their face. And each half face grew another half face, and so you get a two-headed planarian. Creepy. Um, planarians do have different systems in their body. So you can see here some of the different systems they have. They have a excretory system that functions with some similarity to our excretory system, making um, nitrogen-containing waste like urine, although not exactly. Uh, they have a simple nervous system. Anyways, so these guys are from Michigan. There are a bunch of ribbon worms that are marine. There are some that you can see are pretty interestingly colored. They look a little snake-like. They are flat worms. These Sorry about that. These ones here, I believe, are parasitic ones. Um, you don't want them in your digestive system. The next group are the pseudocelomates. Pseudo meaning fake, false, lying. So the pseudocelomates do have that kind of an opening layer between their outside parts and their guts parts. Um, but it's not a true coelom like what we would have, that true opening. Um, the uh, things in this group are the roundworms and the rotifers. Again, you have some that are free living, so they swim around and do their own business, and some that are parasitic. And finally, we get digestive systems with two ends. 
Um, so we have um, this Cercaria, which I think this is from the group that can cause swimmer's itch. Um, and then you have a nematode. Um, lots of these nematodes are found in the soil. Again, they are just tiny, tiny things. We call them worms, but they're not really worms. Next, we get to the things you think of as worms. The annelids. Um, phylum annelida, the annelids. Um, they're also called the segmented worm because their body has like little sections on it. If you look at an earthworm, you can see all those little sections on them. So the annelids include the earthworms and their relatives, the leeches, as well as a large number of marine, so ocean, worms called polychaetes. And some polychaetes don't even look like worms um, because you see their gills, brightly colored gills. If you remember from like the Little Mermaid, those things that look like flowers sticking out of the coral. A lot of those are polychaete worms, and you're seeing their gills sticking up. And then when you scare them, they suck their gills down back in there. So they're not a plant. They're an animal, and they're technically a worm. Weird. Here are your leeches. Not all leeches are bloodsuckers. All leeches have 34 body segments. And there is a medicinal substance called herudin, which is an anticoagulant. It stops your blood from clotting, um, and it is harvested from leeches. Now, however, I think they can make it in labs as well. But traditionally, the source was leeches. Earthworms! These guys are nice. They make the soil better. Except they don't belong in Michigan. There are no earthworms native to Michigan. All of the earthworms that we have in Michigan were brought here either by European settlers, either intentionally or unintentionally. So let's say you bring a tree to plant in your orchard or your yard. And there are worms hanging out under the roots of the tree when you dig it up. You moved them. Okay? Um, basically, um, earthworms don't belong in Michigan, um, but they are here and they are here to stay. They do have a minor negative impact on some of our forest ecosystems. Next, we have the mollusks. Mollusks include a large variety of animals. They all have soft bodies, but they often have a hard shell. Mollusks can be found on land, terrestrial, or in marine, ocean, or in freshwater environments. So we have some aquatic snails that are used for determining the uh, um, health of a stream. Uh, in Europe, they eat escargot snails. Uh, there he is. They eat those. I've never had escargot. I eat a lot of things. Snails not on the list. Another mollusk that we have in Michigan that does not belong here are the zebra mussels. Zebra mussels are originally from Europe and Asia. Uh, they came over in boats, and now they are spreading. The biggest issue with them is that they plug pipes. Well, that's the biggest economic issue. Um, another issue they do is they actually grow on top of our native mussels and clams and um, prevent them from feeding, prevent them from moving, and basically um, kill them. Next, we have the echinoderms, echinodermata. Derm, if you'll remember, means skin. Echinoderm literally means pokey skin comes from the same root word as what the, the what they had in Latin for the hedgehog, that little prickly thing, uh, the little prickly mammal. Anyways, the echinoderms um, are almost, almost all have radial symmetry. So they have symmetry around a central region. The arthropods. The arthropods have an exoskeleton made of chitin. It's estimated that more than three-fourths of all known living things in the past and the present were arthropods. So, guys, we're outnumbered. Arthropods have us outnumbered by a lot. Um, this group includes insects, crustaceans like crabs and shrimp, and others like millipedes and centipedes and arachnids. Speaking of arachnids, in Michigan, we have the northern widow. It is a close relative of the black widow. Um, and, uh, they are venomous and they can cause, um, death to humans. However, uh, it doesn't seem to bite as often as its cousins. And, uh, we don't usually run into them too much. And then we have, uh, the deer tick, also an arachnid. Look at those eight legs. Uh, the deer tick can spread Lyme disease. Not a nice disease to have. You can see that when this map was printed, Michigan was not a high-risk area. Um, but Lyme disease causes this bullseye rash and causes severe health concerns. I'm out of time, so I'm going to put the chordates in a separate video. So tune back in for my information about the chordates. Thank you.